Welcome back to Money Exchange. Emerging market currencies like Brazil, Russia, India, China, and many more have been hit for six this year. And the outlook doesn't look all that positive for 2016. The euro has also taken a big hit, with the ECB lowering its official deposit rate and committing to inject more than $1 trillion into the European economy. To help us understand what expectations we should have leading into 2016, Zachary Latif from TLG Capital joins us on the line from Chennai in India. Zachary, thanks for your time and welcome to Money Exchange. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew. Zach, tell us, is there a particular currency that we're looking at going into 2016 with respect to emerging market currencies that looks most vulnerable? A lot of people talk about the basket of emerging market currencies. You're in India at the moment on a trip for Christmas. Is, is, is there something that stands out to you that we need to keep an eye on next year? Uh, absolutely. I think what would really benefit the situation is much more granularity when we mean emerging markets. So as an example, uh, just as an immediate example, the Indian rupee is going to fare somewhat better, much better than other commodity-heavy currencies like the ruble or the rand or um, uh, the Bra uh, Brazilian real, simply because, uh, first of all, uh, as we all know, uh, the markets have been pricing in a rate hike for the past uh, year or so. Uh, virtually all EM markets have done so. And I think what we're going to see right now in EM space is a distinguishing factor between not only which currencies have uh, better managed budgets, but more importantly, which ones are more vulnerable to commodity prices, uh, their drops, and and especially to oil prices. So as an example for the Indian rupee and for the Turkish lira, in fact, there's much more resilience on the ground because obviously with dropping fuel prices, they are seen to have uh, much more of a buffer against potential rate hikes. So, Zach, what about oil price? We've obviously seen a significant drop in oil this year again. And looking ahead to next year, a lot of analysts are suggesting that oil prices are going to remain low. Therefore, we can expect the Canadian dollar to remain relatively low. What are your thoughts with respect to oil? Any rebound in 2016? And, and will Canada get a residual benefit and the Canadian dollar move higher with the US Fed now raising rates? Well, apparently oil is now uh, at half the level um, of its five-year average. It, the prognosis doesn't seem to be uh, so strong for, for the underlying commodity, not only because of the geopolitical realities, but also because of new discoveries. Uh, I think we're seeing a broad systemic decline in commodity prices in general, not only in oil. We're seeing the same thing in iron ore. A lot of suppliers are now having to manage their inventories and manage their release of inventories. So, uh, um, oil prices don't seem to be recovering from where we are right now. This recent drop in the last month was uh, so somewhat unexpected for the market as well. So we could see uh, a longer-term decline. Uh, what that would do for currencies that are predominantly oil-producing, such as Canada, such as Russia, it is that, and especially coupled with the fact that even though uh, the Fed has, re uh, has released a statement talking about graduated rate hikes, obviously trying not to spook the entire global system, System, but it, it's almost a double whammy in a sense that um, we, we are almost definitely going to see across the board weaker currencies in any, uh, in both, for both the Canadian dollar and for the, Russian, uh, for the Russian ruble. Okay, let's look across to Europe now. We saw the euro rally recently after the December 3rd statement from Mario Draghi rally up to 110, in fact, in the last few days. And it's now turned on its heels, started to move a little bit lower after the Fed statement. Is that around the high that we're likely going to see, Zachary? A lot of traders in this part of the world are talking about a good shorting opportunity now on the euro against the US dollar, back down to the lows we saw this year. What are your thoughts leading into next year on the euro against the US dollar? Well, 
uh, as I've said before, I think that on a broader base level, the euro is on a bearish decline. Uh, maybe the timing won't be uh, won't be as um, won't be as intense as uh, as the market is expecting. But we are seeing eventually a trend towards parity. Um, the problems within the eurozone certainly haven't gone away. There is a, a, a similar still remains. Obviously, stimulus wasn't as extensive as expected. So uh, there is some support for the euro in that perspective. But again, uh, obviously, all the factors point out to the fact that, uh, if anything, we've seen the highs of euro, uh, of euro dollar, and now we can expect it to weaken, uh, especially over the next two or three quarters. Uh, with where uh, you know we're expecting almost four rate hikes next year from the U.S., almost 100 basis points of uh, uh, tightening. So yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look good for the euro right now. Obviously, how to play this out in terms of timing is going to be really the question. Uh, you know, do you put on a more long, a longer term trade to, uh, or you know, I, I think that's where we're going to see maybe over next summer that uh, we could not necessarily be at parity, but very close to that. Well, certainly uh, the euro USD is a positive carry trade being short, so uh, it might not be a bad opportunity to get short now. With respect to Europe, Zach, is is Greece likely to come back and? bite Europe on the bum again in 2016 or have their problems uh, dissipated for the time being? Well, I think 2016 is. In, we're not going to see a Greek crisis in 2016 simply because most of the agreements have were structured over a two or three year cycle. So even if we do see stirrings from Greece, it's probably something that would emerge. Uh, Greece is the sort of story that comes around every two or three years. So we are going to see a 2017, 2018 um, Greek crisis if there is going to be any. I mean, there there are some more worrying stories within uh, the eurozone, such as. Portugal and Spain, they have uh, very high unemployment rates. Uh, their public debt to GDP ratios are still very, very weak. But at the same time, um, I, I I, w I would not really expect within the eurozone to have a national crisis uh, any time in the first two quarters of this year, simply because w with the stimulus program and with the Greek experience, there's, uh, there's a time for re resilience and recovery within the eurozone itself and some sort of restructuring as well. So even though we are seeing a weakening of the euro, it's more, uh, it's more driven by external factors as opposed to internal factors of uh, a, a uh, intrinsic eurozone weakness. Those problems are there, but then you know, in terms of the markets, uh, we can have uh, you know some short time, uh, short term respite uh, for the constituent countries. Okay, let's have a chat about the pound for a minute, Zach, if we can. The Bank of England expected to raise rates in perhaps the second quarter of 2016 at this point, or that's what futures uh, markets are anticipating. The Fed's decision in the U.S. to raise rates. Uh, this week. Has that made Mark Carney's job a little bit easier going into next year, particularly with the low volatility we've seen in the market since the Fed pulled the trigger? When are you anticipating the Bank of England will raise rates and will the pound continue to rise again next year? I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a rate hike in 2016. Um, I mean, it, it, remember, you know, the markets were anticipating rate hikes in the U.S. much earlier than, uh, you know, and we've actually been delayed there so until two days ago. But at the same time, I think for the Bank of England, um, you know, we still have the issue of uh, U.K. deflation, uh, which has come back in September. So, and we also have a weaker prospect for economic growth. So I would be a bit, I mean, while the markets are right to start pricing in the possibility of rate hikes, but at the same time, um, it's, not, it's, not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a slam dunk. We are still going to see, um, you know, some, uh, some uncertainty about when rates are uh, risen exactly. You know, yes, it's, it's necessarily laying the groundwork for a rate rise, but I don't ne think that we'll necessarily see a rate rise um, as soon as, uh, you know, uh, fall next year. Zach, thanks so much for your time throughout the year on the program. Have a wonderful time in Chennai and in India while you're back there and we'll look forward to having you on the program next year again. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay. All right. With our last program for the year, I thought we'd have a look at my top currency investment tips leading in to 2016. I'll get to look after 
thousands of clients around Australia and around the world, and I want to share with you my top seven tips. Number one, the market's expectation of what central banks with, will do. If you want to be a successful currency investor and position your money alongside the smart money, the smart money that's looking forward to six and 12 months out, start to look at what expectations are of central banks. And as you've seen on the program tonight, consistently again and again, we're seeing interest rate potential reductions in Asia, emerging market currencies, US rates going higher, and we're likely going to see that play out in currency values in 2016. So make sure you continue to watch the expectations of central banks. Number two, if you're a technical trader, don't look at the small time frames, look at the big picture time frames. Most of the institutional banking colleagues that I associate with and talk to are not looking at one minute, five minute, 30 minute or one hour charts. They're looking at bigger time frames, daily, weekly, monthly, and that's where the major trends are developing based on those interest rate differentials and what those central bank expectations are. So look at bigger time frames. Number three, Make sure you look after your risk management. It's your only salvation. So many times I see traders send me trading statements and they're doing well and it's always one trade that destroys their trading account for the year or perhaps upsets a good month they've been having. You have to be incredibly disciplined with your risk management. Most institutional banking traders are trying to keep it to around about sort of the 1%, maybe 1.5%. Most novice, newbie, mum and dad type traders, their risk management's all over the place. Number four, resist the urge to get out. Right now, those of you that are short on the Aussie dollar, long on the US dollar, long on the pound, short on the euro, resist that urge to get out because I think we're gonna see markets push through next year. Number five, Win big and lose small. It's the only way, guys. Make sure next year you have trades, that you have big winning trades and minimize risk and wait for those central bank movements because they will happen. Number six, trade the market knowing you'll be wrong a lot. I know we wanna be right, but we are gonna be wrong a lot. Keep the losses to a minimum, minimum maximize the profits. And number seven, expect the unexpected. Anything can happen in financial markets. As we saw this year with the Swiss National Bank, we're likely to see some more of, more of those surprises next year. Not likely that big, but expect the unexpected. Well, this is our last money exchange program for 2015. A very special thank you to all our viewers throughout the year and the team here at Sky News. We look forward to doing it all again next year. Have a great Christmas and I'll see you then.